Good morning, everybody. My name is Jason. I'm our youth pastor. I'm one of our elders. It's good to see you. It's good to be here. And this morning, we're going to continue to call out to the Lord. We, we know that you have, have come this morning and gathered to experience Jesus. We know that. And, and our hope is that you would encounter truth and blessing and hope and joy and that you would be more filled with hope than you are at this moment. I'm going to read some scripture to us this morning, but first I'd like us to pause for a moment of quiet. And on behalf of all of us, Jesus, what do you have this morning? With hands open and ears open, Jesus, what do you have for each of us this morning? I'm going to read these scriptures and you can read them also. You can listen also. You can close your eyes. Uh, whatever fits you this morning. Second Thessalonians 3.5 May the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the steadfastness of Christ. 1 John 5.4 Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. And tag-teaming with 1 John is Romans 10, 17, that very faith that overcomes the world comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Romans 8, 15, For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons and daughters, by which you cry out, Abba, Father. Colossians 3, Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Hebrews 4. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Isn't that a good one? Right there, we get this access because of Christ. And with confidence, we can move into the throne of grace. So good. Second Chronicles 20.12, a verse I read last Sunday. Oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we are powerless before this great multitude who are coming against us. Nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are on you. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And some words of Jesus in the Gospel of John, chapter 16. But now I am going to him who sent me. And none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. How did those words fall on those guys in that circle? Guys, I enjoyed being with you, and it's actually better for you if I leave. They were just getting to know who this guy was, and he's saying, it's time for me to go, and it's better. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. 
And he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father. And you no longer see me. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, but when he the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of mine and disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. And Romans 12, 1 and 2, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. This morning... Our theme to invite you into in song, word, scripture, sharing, is hearing from God. And so some questions to uh, have you all together on the same page. What does this even mean to hear from God? When you hear that phrase, hearing from God, I wonder what it does to you. Why did Jesus reference over and over those who have ears to hear, let that hear? What do you do with what you hear from God? And how do you test it out, whatever you are hearing? Do you even believe that God still speaks today? Would be maybe a good one before any of those. Why do you want? him to speak to you. So those questions, some might get directly answered and some might just get to linger with you. Uh, next is Bill Foles, who's going to come share with us about hearing from God. Morning, open door. 41 plus years ago, remember that, Grace? <laughs> 41 plus years ago, I walked into, walked, began my life with Jesus here at Open Door. And I'm thinking, dang, I'm not even 41 years old. <laughs> anybody, anybody believe that? Okay, we'll go on. Uh, I was mentored and discipled for three years by Tom Allen, the Tom Allen of Tom and Joyce Allen. And during that time, we studied the life of King David in the book of Samuel. God declared King David as a man after God's own heart. That really hit deep with me. I'm just this young baby heathen who was a heathen, became a believer, and I'm thinking, wow, what does that mean? Uh, for many months after, I would ask God if I too could have a heart after his. Yet, all the while, I was thinking David was one of a kind. But I kept asking and asking anyways. One day he answered me with a yes. So at 25 years old, my journey with him began a different route. Looking back, I felt like I was a student, about to learn something that I really wanted. Yet there were times I felt like I had ditched class. And other times I had learned so many deep things. He began to teach me things about prayer. That's his voice, to be recognizable in my midst. He did this by showing me other people of faith in Scripture who would pray and how Jesus himself would pray, but more importantly, what they prayed. He would put people on my mind and heart. Sometimes it seemed random to pray for them or call them or go see and pray over them. I began to hear God's heart as I read Scriptures, which was profound, because I had asked him, to let me hear your heart. But more importantly, let me hear truth because I know that's your character. 
Your heart is your character, Lord. I would read Psalms and come away overwhelmed at his heart revealed. I kept asking God to speak to me, to not just let my eyes see words, but to see deeper. I wanted to discern his heart, not just take apart his word, but discern his heart. Something my natural man couldn't do or even wanted to do. I began asking not for just a wisdom, but his wisdom. I wanted him above every request, above every answer I thought I needed. King David said while in the midst of being, of hiding from King Saul, who King Saul wanted to kill him, King David said about God that his presence alone was his help. And I remember as this young believer thinking, are you kidding me, David? Here's a man who wants to kill you, and you say your presence alone was your help? No, I, I just didn't see what David saw. I began to realize I was missing God. I was only seeing natural circumstances and not eternal things. I wanted to see God, not just his healings or his wisdom or whatever that I needed. I once wrote, don't just show me the miracles, God, but show me the God of the miracles. As I began to recognize his voice, and that takes time, by putting myself, here's how, by putting myself in places to hear his voice, like reading his word, like speaking with other believers about scriptures, a persistence in asking God to let me hear his voice and to know it was him and not me. He would say powerful, undoing things to me at times. And sometimes it would be the oddest things, like driving down a street one day and I hear the phrase, the Lord sees. My first thought was, well, of course he does. But, but what was that all about? But knowing his voice, I decided, okay, i got to write this down. So I wrote it down. Yeah, while well, I'm driving, kind of like texting. <laughs> as soon as I put the pad down, I hear a horn blare, and I thought I had strayed into another lane. And I look over, and it's my dear friend Ian Gennari. I had mentored Ian, and he knows me. And he yells out, what's the Lord saying to you? And I thought, you got to be kidding me. So I hold up the pad of paper, and I yell, the Lord sees. And he yells back, pull over. And we talked, and he asked me again, what did the Lord say to you? And I repeated it. And he's shaking his head, and he's telling me, I've just been asking God, Lord, don't you see? Amen. And this was not me. I knew this was God. It's not my boast in me but even more so him through me. My deepest cry then, and still is today, I want to know him, to understand his character, to learn to trust his character instead of my own, to have a heart like his heart. I want his wisdom, his understanding, his peace. I want his control, his contentment, his way of doing life. I want to be used for his people and his glory. Now, how is this going to happen? And God tells us, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. So, get to know the spirit by spending time with him, by spending time with others who do know him and pursue him and because they're hungry for him. That's what true godly discipleship and fellowship is, by the way. Keep asking God for it. Every day I talk to him about anything and everything. I thank him for answers, but mostly what I really thank him for is the life he's given me in his son. Still, after 41 years, blows me away. I praise him. And often I ask this of God. Spirit of God, my teacher sealed in me. Teach me. Lead me. Over the years, I've had to ask myself at times, am I teachable? Am I right now teachable? Will it be okay if I just sit at your feet, Lord, and learn like Mary and Martha did? I'm not talking about lazy. I'm talking about humility. Because every day there's a battle under humility. And here's the, the battle's true arena. It's my ways and my thoughts versus his ways and his thoughts. 
in the circumstances of my life as I see it, as I know it, as I want it to be. It leads me to doubt at times, and fear or anger show up at the door of my heart, sometimes banging at the door with shouting noises and poisonous things under my mind and thoughts. I get anxious and confused in the midst of it. I fail. So now what am I to do? Fear often lies in the unknown, the unseen, the shame. I become paralyzed until I recognize the reality of what I'm in. I'm in a spiritual battle. Then I call on the Lord until it dawns on me again that God sees and he knows perfectly. Then I'm okay to draw near and stay close to him. Like Peter said, like Jesus said to Peter, Peter, Satan has demanded to sift you, but I have prayed for you. There is a spiritual battle around me in this world, towards my flesh and under my mind and thinking. And if Jesus always intercedes and prays for me, then I too probably should always pray. To stay cl- and here's what it means, to stay close to the shepherd of my soul. This is only by faith, and this is the faith I'm talking about, that will dare to, dare to trust God to be God. Real faith seeks God. Real faith stays with God. Like the psalmist in Psalm 42 says, he, he's calling out to his own heart to put his focus back on God when he was in the midst of the trouble. I kind of tell myself, soul, search for God. God has insight to himself and to life to give us in his word if we will pray and seek for him. Humility cries out to me. Ask God and leave room for him to do as he desires. Man, that's hard. I have to believe him in every aspect of my life, including his timing and his ways, which are not always my timing and his ways, my ways. Yet when I do this, when I am good with the fact that he is God and I am not, and that he declares himself to be my God, my Lord, my friend, then it is well with my soul. And I'm at peace, and I have his rest. When my eyes are upon him, the author and finisher of my faith, my life, I am a blessed man. And Jason had asked me that I share briefly what God has recently spoken to me as an example of what I hear from God. Well, this past week, this last week, I was going to meet a brother. As always, I'm driving there, and I'm praying. I'm asking the Lord for his wisdom and his discernment. That's so key to ask him for his wisdom and for his discernment. And what to say to this dear son of the faith from God's heart, because that's what I'm recognizing I'm going to see. I'm going to see a dear son of the faith. Now, when I ask this, I don't always receive a word in that specific moment of asking. Sometimes it's not until the middle of the moment. It reminded me of Paul being told that, don't worry what you're going to say to Caesar, because at the moment... Of that time, you will receive it. Often he gives me revelation or insight right as I'm speaking or listening. I recognize it as him. Why? Because it's intended to encourage and remind one another of the truth of our God and what he says. So God answered my prayers. I spoke to this brother of the character of God and what this brother's circumstances really were from God's point of view, something that he may not have seen or even considered. I have found God wants to use us for one another under kingdom realities and that we, that we may have forgotten or that we may never have really believed. God be praised. Thank you, Bill. So the first and primary way that we hear from the Lord is the scriptures. This is full of beauty, poems, confessions, songs, promises, real people, real time walking on this earth who said, this is what it was like for me. Paul saying, I wanted to go to this town No, go to this town. Boom. Real experiences all over this. So that's our first and primary place of hearing from God. 
in fact, if you hear something that's not in Scripture, then it's a good thing to ask if you have indigestion or something else going on. Because what we hear from God will never be in conflict with what is written. Um, another place. Have you ever been up early in the morning? Maybe up on top of a hill or a mountain or on a balcony overlooking the beach uh, in the forest and, and through trees maybe. And you start to see the breaking of a new day. And it's golden and yellow and amber. And God speaks right there in that moment. I do this for you. Every time that he creates a new day, he speaks. Maybe you have seen something beautiful in the sky, a large hawk or an eagle, and you are just in awe. Maybe you've been to one of those beautiful places in our world and seen either those trees you can drive through with your car or waterfalls or rivers, and you just are in awe. The Lord speaks through his creation. He created it all, and he continues to speak through his creation. People, he speaks all the time. Bill just shared that, that he speaks through people. And, and you, who have the spirit of the living Christ inside you, can speak truth to me and bless me and bring reminder, bring joy, bring hope, bring life to me. So people, I, I find, and this is lately for me, I find the Lord speaking through a really good meal. One of those meals that you want to savor. And, and you are in the moment with people enjoying the meal, and you realize the Lord's delight being spoken over you in that moment. Maybe a song, maybe a lyric from a song, or a word from a song, or a stanza from a song. Are there stanzas? Is that correct? A stanza. <laughs> Something in a song that captures you, and the Lord speaks to you there, and you just stay with that. Uh, I have had some times, and maybe you have, where the Lord speaks through through an old photograph, and I'll pick it up and stare at it, and someone I'll be in the photo, and someone will have their arm around me, and I'll and I'll feel the Lord's love in that moment, His care for me. So nothing is outside the realm of God speaking to you and I, and in fact, He has something for us in everything. He does, in fact, have something for us in everything. So a couple examples for me. You just heard from Bill, but let me give you a couple examples for me, and our hope is that in hearing uh, a couple of us, and then in, in a little bit when we have an opportunity, give an opportunity for you to share, that we would encourage each other in this arena of hearing from the Lord. I love to hike, and I go up Shaw Butte, and I dialogue with the Lord the whole time, up and down. God, what's going on? Uh, what do you have for me today? And um, I heard, get your house in order on one of my hikes. And immediately thought, am I going to die? Right? I mean, that's with get your house in order, that's what you think of, right? That's the first thing. And so... I had to pause and say, God, is that it? Like, am I going to die? And really quickly, no. That's not what this is about. But I didn't know what it was, so I held this phrase. Get your house in order. And, and for weeks, I just kept chewing on this like, and asking God more. Every time I would hike, I would walk. I ended up sharing it with a couple of people. What, what do you think this is about? Get your house in order. And eventually... I was drawn to, this is for you to make space for me. Get your house in order led me to get rid of some things, paint some things, clean some things, organize, so that I could have space 
to hear what he had for me. So it was, it was a preparation statement that I was hearing, get your house in order. So another way for me is last week, I, I, those of you that were here, I, I asked for you to consider asking Jesus what he has for you every day and, and keeping track of that somehow in a journal or a napkin or your phone or something. And I did that too. And Monday morning, I heard abide with me. So all Monday, I just stayed with that. What does that mean? Lord, what does abide with me have for me in today? And then on Friday, uh, three days ago, after just the preparation of this and uh, getting ready for an all-day event that we had yesterday with the high schoolers, and I was just, I was just kind of tight and feeling the stress, and the Lord whispered, just play. I'll take care of everything else. And so I, I took note of that. I write these things down so that I can be reminded of them later. Just play. Something that I do normally, naturally, but I hadn't been doing all week in the stress of trying to get some things done. So those are a couple ways that it plays out for me. And, and um, I want to say um, some, some, some things behind the, the thing. So if hearing from God is the thing, what's the thing behind the thing? Um, every one of us needs to discern for ourselves how we are going to hear from God. It is unique to you. How, when, where. And so that is for you to discern. Our posture with and towards God is of paramount importance to this arena. We are no longer beggars. We have access to the throne of grace, and we can boldly go there. We are sons and daughters who get to crawl up in the lap of our dad and nestle right in there and stay close to his heartbeat. That's our posture towards him now. The veil has been torn, and we get to go in and have access with our dad. That's one of the things behind the thing. Another thing is that God longs for you and I to be whole. He is a part of restoring all things on this planet, you and I included. He wants you and I to live with our hearts fully alive, to mature more and more into who he has us. There is a deep, hidden wholeness inside each of us. There's not more for us to go grasp. We have it all already hidden inside of us. And when we are living our best life, it's when we take off the mask and we live full and free and we honor that original birthright of our wholeness. This is why we want to spend these weeks here calling out to the Lord together. We have something beautiful inside of us, each of us, and we want together to hear that and to bless each other. We forget so often that our truest nature is fully immersed in Jesus, and that's why we would want to hear from the Lord those things that are already true about us, whether they come in a whisper or a loud, loud voice. So pausing to listen reminds us who we are. So let me get uh, practical for a few minutes. Uh, John 16. This is where uh, my buddy Nacho Libre says, let's get down to the nitty gritty. John 16. This is Jesus circling up with his buddies, and they are having some fantastic conversation. And I read this to us earlier, so I think I'm going to start in verse 12. <clears throat> I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will disclose to you what is to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall take of mine and shall disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said that he takes of mine and will disclose it 
to you. This um, crazy and beautiful tangled relationship of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we call it the Trinity, is on display right here. Maybe in this 2018 year we could spend a couple Sundays exploring the Holy Spirit, our comforter, our guide, our prayer, our helper. One of the most beautiful spiritual blessings that we have because of Jesus. So this hearing from God, I already said that it's for each of us to discern how, when, where we hear from God. And it's kind of like a muscle. It needs working out for us to grow in it, for us to mature in it. It, it needs stretching. And so this is something that we get to keep doing as we mature in our relationship with Jesus. So I would say this, start simple. And by starting simple, maybe your first question that you would ask to hear from the Lord is, do you love me? Something that you know to be true, do you love me? Am I precious to you? Could be a really great place to begin in your journey of hearing from God. And let him respond to you. Let him speak to you. Uh, yes, my kid, my child, my son, my daughter, I love you. When you hear something, ask God to confirm it. Oftentimes, what we hear needs to be confirmed in the community. Oftentimes, we need to ask follow-up questions like I did with, get your house in order. My first question was, am I going to die? But even beyond that, is this from you? God, is a really good question. What shall I do with this that you are speaking, Lord? Who am I to share this with? Are some really, really good questions. Some quick don'ts. Don't say, God told me to. The, uh, the authority that that supposes, supposes is not intended for you. You and I would both be good to be really careful and gentle with our words in this arena. I, I have a hunch. I have a sense. I think maybe the Lord is blowing this wind in. So be really careful in how you say what you are hearing. Don't post what you're hearing from God all over the internet. Don't get discouraged if there's silence. And maybe instead ask the Lord, what do you have for me in the silence? And fight the human tendency to compare what you're hearing with what they're hearing. You heard from Bill, and you heard his story. Okay, I heard this, and I wrote it down, and then boom, he ran into Ian. We could strive for that instead of the God who's behind that. So be careful. Fight that. What you hear from Jesus is for you and Jesus. What the Lord speaks to you is what he speaks to you. It's for you and him. Hearing the voice of God in a whisper, a song, a word, creation, a friend, it, it's going to benefit in time all the relationships around you because everything that the Lord speaks and does in us is for the benefit of the kingdom of God in time. When you ask him if he loves you, yes, that's for you, and God intends to bring blessing to someone else through the answer that he brings. As we grow in this area, our awareness of how it brings blessing will also grow. And there's a, there's a flow to this. It, it, it goes something like this. It's a receiving and a giving. It's the rhythm that we see in John 16 with the Holy Spirit. And it works for the Holy Spirit and Jesus and the Father. And, and let it be our rhythm that we would first receive from the Lord. And then 
give. So that flow and that rhythm is the same for us as the Holy Spirit and the Father. Now, last week, I asked all of us to consider memorizing Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. There was some chatter about whether it was Romans 12, 1 and 2 or Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. It was Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. And, and, and then I said, would you consider asking Jesus what he has for you? Kathy Darms had beautifully shared how she writes things in her journal and then goes back and looks at them and reminds herself of the truth. And so what we'd like to do is take the risk to say, would you share what you heard in this last week? There's a microphone, bam, bam, and bam, if you want to come up front, but more likely in the back. And even if you weren't here last week, maybe you've heard something already in this hour that you would like to bless us with. And so if it's quiet, then it's quiet. If one person shares, if nine people share, we would love to hear what the Lord spoke to you this week. All right. So I've always been very afraid of bees, you know, and it would just... I, I would feel the fear building up, and I would just think of Jerry Maguire and the kids saying, bees can smell fear, and I would think, don't be afraid, all right? Because <laughs> the bees can smell the fear. And I, the other day, Adam, my friend over there, was at my house, and we heard this bee just really violently banging against the window, trying to get out, and I was like, well, we better help it out, you know? And, but I was like, well, Adam, you better help it out. So Adam went and got the bee and took it out. And the bee started licking his hand when he was outside. And we started trying to, you know, coax the bee away. And it just would not get off. It would not get off even when it was near a flower. It saw the flower, it sniffed it, it went back to Adam's hand, started licking it again. And... In that moment, the fear was just completely gone. And it was a big sign to me that God is large enough, that God is powerful enough to just wipe away fear. Yeah. Hi. I'm not a member here, but I'm visiting, and I'm drifting around. I've been drifting for a while since I had a pretty big storm in my life. Whereas I met God more personally, more intimately, and meeting God. You know, the pastor says something about going to God's throne and sitting with him. I tell you, when you do that, you will fear. <laughs> um, I had a vision one time that I was at God's feet. He put me there for some reason because I had this really big storm in my life that just got out of control. And you know how Satan likes to shift people to do strange and odd things. And they think that they're serving the light, but no, you're not when you're with him. And um, God taught me how to believe in him. It was one thing, a message that the pastor that you guys put on the screen last week, besides um, Hebrews that I did study all week long. And I watched God move things, descend off of me. And I tell you, that was a dirty trash bag. <laughs> um, I hope you didn't pick it up. <laughs> um, but um, the other thing that he said was to avoid your lust and to control it. And a mind is a very powerful thing. And when you're with God, he knows what you're thinking. He knows what's in your heart. And he says, if you covet someone with your mind or if you sin with your mind, that's what he sees. And he's taught me over the years after going through such a horrible storm in my life, as I cowered around him, and he makes me very, very strong. 
Sometimes I'm like, wow, who am I, God? And I just shut up. And I just let the spirit move through me and I don't fear what he does because you know, the Holy Ghost is very, the Holy Ghost has a sense of humor, but God, you should fear him because he has a sense of humor, but he's very serious about what he does in a very nice way. And if you, if you move yourself to sin, opposed to seeing what he really wants you to see in that movement, if you choose to go with the fake light that wants to shift you and you'll be forever shifting, then um, I pray that you wake up one day and see the true light. I hope that I get to be there with you. <laughs> Amen. Okay, so I'm a little terrified standing here. I'll talk in front of a lot of people. Not this many. A lot. Um, so last week when I was here, God put a chapter of Mark in front of me, like as I'm praying. I met some old pastoral friends of mine at another church about a friend of mine and other friends who were suffering. And, you know, Hebrews 12 is one that I constantly go over for myself about laying aside the weight and the sin that it so easily ensnares us. And when we're disciplined, you know, it may be painful at the time, but it'll give us peace. You know, the whole chapter, I love it. Um, that's one I stick to. So a friend of mine was heavily involved in some sin, and she, she wasn't hearing from God, and she kept crying out to me, help me, help me, I don't hear God anymore, I'm, I'm, I'm gone, you know, and she's a praise and worship leader in another church was, you know, and in November, her boyfriend overdosed and died in bed with her, and since then, she's been getting shifted and shifted and shifted, and they were all Christians. This last year, I buried 15 other Christians to addiction, and so I was like, what do I do? So she's really been on my heart, and last week, I was praying as I'm in here, and God's like, Mark chapter 9, I'd like to read that to you and explain what it meant to me. Um, Mark chapter 9, verse 14 through, I think, 29. And when he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him, greeted him, and he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? Then one of the crowd answered and said, teacher, I brought you my son. I'll pause there for a second. That's not, for me, it wasn't son. It was friend, mother, daughter, anyone who has a mute spirit. And wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples and that they should not cast it out, but they could not. That they should cast it out, but they could not. He answered him and said, O oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear? How long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought him to him, and when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked his father, how long has he, this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. This first what I recognize is the fire in the water. The water's God, you know. She's being thrown into God, you know, and really trying. But then she's right back in the fire because she's got this spirit. You know, I've had it. I know. And the only way to get rid of it, we get direction here. I did. So Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help me with my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you to come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him. And he came as one dead, so that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he rose. 
And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? So he said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. So immediately when I left here last week, I went on a little fast and immediately started praying and had my Jesus music on all day. All day, no matter if I was doing my homework, it just stayed on and she was really on my heart. The next day, she messages at me. She's on her way from California to here to get some help. And she ended up staying at my house. We celebrated her 30th birthday here. And the next day, God spoke to me again. And I, I made a decision, and my husband supported me. You know, we put her in a treatment facility. And this weekend, when I checked in with her, she said, I heard from God. That was yesterday. Because I had a discussion that you can't, like, you're not hearing from God for a reason. Why don't you try talking to him more directly about how you're feeling? And the problem was that she didn't tell God, I'm mad at you. You know, and when she did that, she heard from him. And it was like the greatest blessing because when I came here, Three years ago, I didn't have anyone who was nice to me. My family issues, like many others. This was the first person in a church program I went into. She was the only one who ever talked to me. She was the first person. She walked up to me, grabbed my hands, asked me what my name was, and said, God wants to give you joy. I had no idea what she was talking about. <laughs> but here it is, three years later, I got to be there for her. And that's what God spoke to me, and that... The deaf and dumb spirit that throws them in, into the water, into the fire, it only comes out with Jesus. It, there's a reason for that. That's that we stop hearing from God. It's an attack sometimes. Sometimes it's God being patient, but for me, it, it was an attack that was trying to throw me back into the fire and out of the water. And that's how I saw it. Huh? Thank you. Not used to talking in a microphone. I'm going to step back from it. I talk pretty loud. Anyways, uh, I wasn't here last Sunday. I had to go take a flight to see my father. And uh, he's one of the man meanest men I've ever known in my life. And, um, but I do want to just keep it short but sweet. That's what God's telling me right now. But as the first gentleman who spoke, with, uh, anyways, about how God can speak to you. Well, God used, I got saved in 2004 in prison, and God used me one day. I was like, well, I want to learn the scripture. My first scripture. I, said, I want to learn the scripture, but I don't want to just pick one. I want to really do something special in my life, and I want to learn something. I want to apply it. So I was walking on the track, as I usually did at night, because there's a place you can see the sunset and uh, through the wire. And, uh, anyways, God said, boom, and I had my Bible. God was going to teach me a lesson that they didn't know. So the Matthew 5 44 says, But I say unto you, because I always had many men there coming at me physically and mentally, nasty, nasty people. There's 78, 25 life members on that yard. But, anyways, and I'm like, okay. And I'm looking through the Bible and I come to Matthew 5 44 and it says, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them that
thought about to straighten me out, but uh, I was coming out of the church and I was walking around and this guy in the wheelchair grabbed my wrist and, and, and uh, he said, I need to talk to somebody and I said, well, I just got saved a few months ago, I'm trying not to die. You know, and, and really, and uh, he, he, he grabbed the wrist and he said, no, I need to talk to you and I got a really serious problem. And I'm like, oh God, I'm like, I don't even know. name is Adonis and we're we're so blessed that that uh, through Gwen that uh, and through this church that that Adonis has come to um, be a Christian and that he has joined our family starting in this year and 
We're glad that we can be starting a new legacy and a new story for Adonis along with Mama Gwen. And uh, it was laid upon my heart last summer. Um, and we had some friends that, that uh, had moved away. And so we had the ability and we said, Lord, what is it that you have for us now? And Sarah and I were walking on an anniversary trip, and and uh, I just felt peace. I, just, I, I felt um, joy and said, let's look into this and see, see how we can be involved in this young boy's life. And so I think it's really a testament to just stepping out and letting God be God in our lives and in others. So we thank Adonis um, that he joined our, our family and, and Mama Gwen for, for the work that she's done with him and that we can, can be together as a, a heavenly family in this church. So thank you all. God, thank you for Adonis. Thank you for the Carl Blooms. Thank you for Gwen. Thank you for the way that you work in crazy, miraculous ways. And thank you for his bravery to say, I'm going to stand up today and say some words. And, and for all of Open Door, would we get to partake of watching him grow up and walk with you for all of his days? Amen. ever know so you should know him <laughs> mm. thank you guys thank you for those that shared and and then um, let me be in the same spirit of last week asking us all to consider another passage of scripture this week it is romans 12 <laughs> one and two and this week the ask isn't to memorize but to meditate and to sit in some space with Romans 12, 1 and 2, and read it slowly. And when you have a word in Romans 12 that catches you, then stop reading and sit with that word and ask the Lord, what do you have for me in this word? So Romans 12, 1 and 2 for this week, Open Door, is our scripture to meditate on. And then next week we'll come back here again and we'll give some space to share. Chris Keck, come on up. It's been, for you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. He committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. And while being criticized and abused, he did not criticize and abuse in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds we were healed. For we were continually straying like sheep, but now we have returned to the shepherd and guardian of our souls. Jesus, you are our shepherd. Oh, that we would stay with you in our hearts and our minds. You stay with us. Your name, among many others, is Emmanuel, God with us. Would you help us hold our hearts to you, our concerns, our fears, 
our pain, our ambitions, our hopes. Because you're, you have an ear to hear every time we call out to you. And because of, of your suffering and sacrifice, Jesus, you have made a way that is stronger to, than any sin, any hurt. Let our mouths speak and our ears listen to you, Jesus.